started. Welcome to the 2021 Ground Truth Seminar Series. And we are recording this seminar and posting it to our webpage uh, for those of you who want to listen to it again or for people who are unable to make it on time. Uh, this is the fifth of nine Ground Truth Seminars that we're hosting through December 14th. Since we are all doing this remotely, the speaker will use an electronic pointer or be descriptive when indicating specific things on the slides. And to help with this format, please mute your audio and turn off your video feed to avoid additional distractions. Also, please keep your questions for the end of the seminar when we'll give you an opportunity to unmute yourself and ask the speaker directly or check them into the chat box and Liz and I will compile them. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind people to join us for next week's speaker, Laura Slater from the University of Alaska Fairbanks College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences, who will talk about crab reproduction and management implications in the Eastern Bering Sea. And that will be held at the same time next Tuesday, November 9th. Please note that on the Sunday before that, we have the time change and we fall back one hour. It might be different uh, for our international viewers. So today's speaker, Melissa Head, is a fisheries research scientist at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, Washington. She works in the Fisheries Resource Analysis and Monitoring Division as part of the Fisheries Research Survey team. She received her bachelor's in marine biology from the College of Charleston, completed a graduate certificate in fisheries management, and is currently working on a master's in science at Oregon State University. She started her fisheries career as a Northeast Pacific fisheries observer and observed for five years. Over the last decade, she has helped to develop a reproductive biology program at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. And today she will be sharing her research related to this and telling us why it is valuable for fisheries management. Thank you, Mark. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I'm gonna to be sharing with you some research at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, evaluating spatial temporal patterns in reproduction of West Coast groundfish. I would like to take a moment to thank the organizers of the Groundfish Seminar Series, Mark and Liz. Um, I've been able to attend many of these over the years and I've always found them very relevant, relevant to the work we're doing at the Northwest Center. So today I'm gonna to introduce you to our research and show why it's critical for sustainable fisheries management. I'll be sharing some interesting trends in reproduction, and then we will discuss drivers of observed variability. I would also like to take a minute to just highlight these first three images showing some of the surveys conducted at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. This research would not be possible if it wasn't for all the hard work conducted in the field by survey scientists, fisheries observers, and port samplers along the coast. So the Northwest Fisheries Science Center initiated a reproductive biology program in the FRAM division in 2009. This was done after fisheries managers repeatedly identified a need for updated maturity information and stock assessments. Since its implementation, we've been able to provide updated maturity estimates for over 28 stock assessments. This data set is incredibly valuable now, as we have also been able to identify spatial trends in these species and track changes over time. So as I mentioned, this program was initiated in 2009, and this was first simply done with the collection of ovarian tissue samples on the West Coast Groundfish Bottom Troll Survey and the Hook and Line Survey of the Southern California Bite. I was hired in 2011 and at that point, I was asked if I could conduct histological analysis on those samples. Um, being a new employee, I was very eager to fulfill this task, but I actually had no knowledge or expertise in the process. Luckily, there was uh, quite a few biologists in NOAA and research scientists who were willing to share their knowledge with us. Um, specifically, we worked with Suzanne McDermott at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where she provided a training for us and help us establish this program. So I always like to thank Suzanne when I give a talk on this because if it wasn't for her willingness um, to engage with us, we wouldn't have been as successful as we have been. So since its initiation, we've expanded our collections to include additional surveys um, and the at Cake Observer Program. 
And then in 2014 and 15, we began a really awesome collaboration with our partners at Oregon and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. This allowed us to get samples from species outside of the survey sampling season. Generally, the surveys are sampling in the summer and fall months, um, and most of these species are spawning in the winter months. So through that collaboration, we've been able to evaluate the full temporal um, reproductive cycle in these species, um, as well as get samples from species that aren't encountered on the surveys, like near shore rockfish species. And over the last decade, we've been utilizing about seven sampling platforms and been able to collect from 44 groundfish species as a result and collected about 23,000 gonad tissue samples. So many of you are probably familiar with the West Coast, but I just wanted to give a very brief background on the dynamics of our coastline so that it's in your head as we discuss spatial and temporal trends in reproduction. The West Coast is comprised of the California current, which is driven by seasonal winds. Generally, upwelling occurs in the summer months and downwelling in the winter. Weaker productivity is also reported in the southern region, south of Point Conception, California. I also want to highlight a couple of important biogeographic regions where oceanographic conditions and productivity vary. Specifically for this presentation, I want to think about Cape Mendocino, California. So this is in Northern California and Point Conception, California in Southern California. We can often describe the coast broken into three regions, the Northern region, which is the US Canada border to Cape Mendocino, the Central Coast, Cape Mendocino to Point Conception and the Southern portion, which is Point Conception to the US Mexico border. This figure on the left hand side is showing mean sea surface temperature along the west coast from 1982 to 2009. I did not produce this figure, but it is in fact from a very interesting study by Jack Ox et al. looking at the seasonal sea surface temperature forecast in the California current and its relation to ENSO variability. The big thing to note is this temperature gradient that we observe along the west coast with cooler water in the northern part um, going to warmer water in the southern port portion of the coast. This is an expected trend in the northern hemisphere. As you progress south, the water gets warmer. But for the purpose of this talk, I wanted to point out the differences between the three regions I just mentioned in the previous slide. The water temperature south of Point Conception, the central coast to Cape Mendocino, and then the northern portion of the coast to the U.S.-Canada border. I would also highlight another area of interest that will come up a couple of times in this talk, Point Reyes, California, um, where this area is essentially around San Francisco, California. So maturity is generally modeled as a standard logistical function where a fish is either mature, which would be marked as a one or immature, a zero. This method is incapable of capturing sexually mature females that may forgo spawning in a given year a term frequently called skipped spawning. This can occur due to poor oceanographic conditions that leads to decreases in nutrition or food availability, also increases in fishing pressure or trauma. So at the Northwest Center, we aim to use up-to-date maturity information for stock assessment models, but also capturing the full geographic range of a species and incorporating rates of skipped spawning into our estimates. This is termed functional maturity, meaning that a fish is cap that is capable of spawning in a given year of sampled. We also seek to incorporate spatial and temporal variability into maturity stock management models and identify potential drivers of change. <clears throat> so because of the West Coast dynamics, it's important to incorporate spatial temporal maturity trends into management models. This also helps to move us closer to ecosystem-based fisheries management practices. Most species are managed across the entire coast as a single stock, though some assessments are spatially structured because of historical management and fishing practices. We know that life history is variable along the West Coast. This includes the timing of spawning, size and age of maturity, as well as growth rates. 
Before the implementation of this program, many assessments had to rely on localized studies for maturity estimates. Many of these were using less accurate methods of macroscopic identification as well. Our research provides coastwide data, which allows for spatial considerations. In addition, assessments often had to rely on outdated estimates. A great example of this is with Dover Sole. In the 2011 stock assessment, maturity information was, came from 1952. This is problematic as we know that rates of maturity can change over time. Thus, we attempt to provide updated maturity estimates across multiple years for management. This allows us to investigate how changes in the marine environments can impact spawning capabilities, including changes to the timing and location of spawning, as well as rates of skip spawning. This can increase our ability to forecast changes in differing environmental conditions. So one of the most basic types of spatial analysis that can be done is simply looking at the distribution of females by maturity status. This simple analysis can provide valuable information for managers, especially as we consider changing spatial closures, closures and utilizing more essential fish habitat, as we're doing on the West Coast right now. So this figure on the left-hand side is showing the distribution of canary rockfish by maturity status with depth on the x-axis and latitude on the y-axis. You can see that the majority of mature fish were found north of 44 degrees latitude, so north of about Newport, Oregon, as well as found in their deeper extent of their range. Now, canary rockfish is no longer listed as an overfish species. But this information could have been really valuable when they declared the species overfished and they set spatial closures to protect them and rebuild them. In addition, we are closely monitoring them and to continue to see them in a rebuilding pattern. Another thing to consider with this latitudinal depth relationship is whether or not this could vary in different oceanographic regimes. Now, the next layer to assessing spatial trends and reproduction is evaluating latitudinal trends in size and age at maturity. One of the first species I did this for was sablefish. You may be familiar with sablefish because they are also of great importance in Alaskan fisheries. They are long-lived, large-sized, highly migratory, and of great value in the Northeast Pacific. They are batch spawners, meaning they release several discrete batches of unfertilized eggs over a protracted spawning season. A recent genetic study on sable fish along the West Coast found that they were a single, well-mixed stock. Our analysis found that size and age at maturity was very similar along the entire coast. So you can see here in the left-hand plot with length on the x-axis and the proportion mature on the y-axis, that across our regional studies, which looked at the northern, central, and southern coast, we found similar estimates of length at maturity. In addition, though, we found that age at maturity did vary along the coast, with fish in the northern region reaching age at 50% maturity at about five years old, and fish in the southern region reaching maturity at around 11 years old. This is an important thing for assessments to ensure that their, their models are capturing. It is possible that changes in growth rates along the coast would capture this difference in age at maturity, but definitely something to consider. So building on this analysis, we recently evaluated lingcod for the 2021 stock assessment. Lingcod is another important groundfish species along the West Coast. It was once overfished, but now recovered, though abundance levels in the southern region are still a concern. A recent genetic study found that there were actually distinct clusters north and south of Point Reyes, California in lingcod. Lingcod do differ from sablefish in that they exhibit site fidelity, so genetic differences might be more expected in this species. They are also batch spawners, similar to sablefish. Males play a really important role in larval survival in this species as they are nest garters. Essentially what this looks like is males will create a nest on the bottom of the ocean floor and females will deposit eggs. Males will then fertilize them and stay with the, with the larvae until they hatch, aerating them and, and um, fighting off predators in the process. 
Because of the recent genetic stock identification and the assessment, we wanted to evaluate a variety of different spatial analyses. We looked at maturity north and south of Point Reyes, California. We looked at maturity between biogeographics to so the northern, central, and southern regions. And we also looked at maturity between a northern and southern management boundary, which is around 4010, um, which was in the 2021 stock assessment. And this is around Cape Mendocino, California. We found the most extreme differences in size and age of maturity between the fish found north and south of Point Conception, California. So on the right hand side, you can see this table of results where fish north of Point Conception were reaching 50% maturity at around 55 centimeters and a little over three years old. And fish south of this region were reaching maturity at about 46 centimeters and almost two years old. So the 2021 assessment chose to use North and south of 4010 because of historical management practices, um, the differences in size at maturity were about five centimeters between those two regions. So our analysis of spatial differences in size and age at maturity didn't directly correlate with the genetic stock structure that was identified in the species, but did correlate with biogeographic regions, specifically between north and south of Point Conception, California. These differences in the southern region might suggest a need for additional stock structure in this assessment. So Dover sole is another valuable groundfish species in the West Coast fisheries. They are found from Baja to Bering Sea and the Eastern Aleutian Islands. So I'm sure it's something that um, you guys have heard of in the Alaskan fisheries as well. Dover are all over the place found on muddy bottom habitat ranging from 20 to 1500 fathoms. So I know on the trawl survey, we frequently encounter them in almost every tow that we do. Dover sole are also batch spawners like ling cod and sable fish. I mentioned earlier that the previous assessment had to rely on maturity estimates from 1952. So in the 2021 stock assessment, we wanted to provide an updated analysis. We became interested in evaluating spatial variability in the species because of other trends that had been observed by the stock assessment scientists. Specifically, they found a difference in depth distribution of size ranges north and south of Point Reyes, California. And also, there had been a study published recently by Tomeri et al. that reported a higher distribution of age one fish north and south of Point Reyes as well. So, we this region. Um, because of the observations that have been reported. Our analysis found females between the two regions had very different maturity trends, with fish south of Point Reyes reaching 50% maturity at about 8 centimeters larger and 10 years older. Interestingly, the study from 1952 reported a length at 50% maturity at about 35 centimeters, which actually occurs about almost in the middle of the, of the estimates we reported um, for the north and the south. However, the differences in age and maturity might suggest a need for an age-based management model, something that needs to be explored in the future. After observing these very striking differences, we began collecting genetic tissue samples from Dover Sol this year to determine if variability we observed is related to environmental conditions or genetic differences. So now on to Pacific cake. Pacific cake is our most abundant ground fish in the California current system. It is both commercially and ecologically valuable. It's essentially our pollock of the West Coast. Cake is fast growing. They're also batch spawners and they have a protracted spawning season. Early analysis of maturity and spawning in this species reported a length at 50% maturity of about 38 centimeters by Dorn and Saunders. And also early reports identified that this fish was spawning from January through March in Southern California. The thought was that all the fish were migrating to Southern California and then larvae were transported up to the California current. We have heavily sampled this species because of their value, but also because there was so much variability in maturity patterns, we were having a hard time identifying what was going on. So one of the first things that surprised us is that we observed hake spawning outside of their reported spawning season, if you remember was January through March. 
In fact, we found females in spawning condition throughout the year. However, this did appear to vary from year to year. We also found frequent aborted batches, skip spawning in adults, as well as even senescence in older females, which is an uncommon thing um, for marine fishes where essentially a female over time will become incapable of spawning. So here you can see in this image was a histological slide of senescence identified in a 14 year old Pacific hake, as well as here, a fish that was caught off northern Washington by the trawl survey in August, and you can see that the ovaries are ripe and running. So, because of the frequency of spawning we observed outside of the winter months, we wanted to understand if this was a function of year and or environmental regimes. This figure produced by Dr. Kaylee Summers shows the frequency of fish observed in spawning condition, shown in pink, during the survey sampling months of May through October. You can see visually that there was a higher frequency of fish in spawning condition in 2014. 2014 through 2016 was an El Nino regime. In addition, late 2013 was also the beginning of an unusual warming trend that we con kindly refer to later as the warm blob. I think most of you are probably familiar with this phenomenon as it extended up to Alaska, also impacting fisheries in this region. So now I hope to do a decadal analysis on this species because we have been able to collect for a full decade across different oceanographic regimes. This may allow us to determine if spawning hake is protracted during certain oceanographic regimes, essentially extended for longer time periods throughout the year. This may also allow us to make predictions on spawning output under varying environmental conditions and maybe even understand a little bit more about the dynamics behind this boom and bust species. So estimating maturity in hake turned out to be really messy at first. The data was all over the place and it took a lot of different analyses to identify what was going on. I like to share this earlier figure that was created by Dr. Alan Hicks when I talk about Hake because it shows how messy the data was. There were a variety of analyses where we looked if there was a seasonal impact on our estimates, if it was a survey sampling type since we're using many different methods to get samples from Hake, or if in fact there was something going on geographically. Eventually, we identified that there was a trend north and south of Point Conception, California. So you can see here in the figure with length on the X axis and proportion mature on the Y axis, this red line are all the fish caught south of Point Conception and all these other lines are a variety of different other regional studies we looked at that were north of Point Conception, California, and they followed a similar trend. I also mentioned that skip spawning was common in this species, but it turned out that most of the skip spawning was coming north of Point Conception. So we're currently focusing on identifying if this trend is related to oceanographic conditions or if there are genetically distinct stocks in Pacific Hake. We are conducting a genetic study that's been ongoing for like the last three years. Um, I would say that earlier studies did not find genetic stock structure in this species. And currently, it doesn't look like we're seeing much stock structure, but the results aren't out yet. So after identifying trends in Pacific Hake and identifying that there was a regional um, impact on maturity, specifically north and south of Point Conception, we were able to produce a pretty accurate maturity estimate that reflected these trends and a much smoother relationship. Here you can see this is north of Conception on the left-hand side, um, where we were identifying a lot of skip spawning in those fish. And then south of point conception, we have a very smooth relationship where we did not observe any skip spawning. In addition, the fish north of conception were reaching 50% maturity at about 11 centimeters larger and a year and a half older. So now that I've shared the value of incorporating spatial trends in size and age at maturity estimates, I would like to shift my focus on thinking about how skip spawning, so mature females failure to spawn in a given year, how this can vary annually and spatially. You just saw in Pacific Hake that it can vary spatially. Here I'll be sharing trends in Aurora rockfish. 
Aurora are from the Sebastes family, which are live bearers, meaning they release live young during the spawning season. So here on the right-hand side, you can see a histological image of a fully um, mature larvae. Aurora are long-lived rockfish up to 125 years old. They are deep dwelling up to 700 meters and they're found along the entire U.S. West Coast and into British Columbia. With this species, we wanted to explore a new method for estimating maturity that could capture non-asymptotic behavior directly into the model. I worked with Jason Cope, a stock assessor at the Northwest Fishery Science Center, to develop a method for doing this. He employed a flexible cubic spline method that has the ability to capture trends and skip spawning. So here in this figure, you can see what we're terming functional maturity. The spline is shown in black, um, and you can see that it has the ability to move around and capture these skip spawning fish. We evaluated two regions of study based on data availability and observed trends in, ma in maturity, north and south of Cape Mendocino, California. We did attempt to evaluate south of conception as well, but data was limited in this region, and we will need to collect more information to identify how trends vary in that region. But here you can see on this plot on the right hand side that skip spawning and the shape of the curve differed in the northern and southern regions. The northern region is shown in blue and the southern region is shown in red. Results show that rates of skip spawning increased over the size of the fish in the north, but additional data is needed to determine if this trend would vary from year to year. Because data on the species was collected over a five-year span, we also looked at mat if maturity could vary annually. We found that most years produced similar rates with the exception of 2014, this line shown in yellow in the plot, which reported larger sizes at 50% maturity. If you remember from the discussion on Pacific Hake earlier, 2014 was the beginning of an El Nino cycle and also defined by the warm blob. It is possible that an increase in juvenile abortive maturation was observed this year, which could lead to a larger size at maturity. Abortive maturation is a phenomenon described in the Sebastes family and other marine fishes. Essentially, a fish that's reaching size or age at first maturity that would normally attempt to spawn will abort the spawning attempt. This could look like eggs in your early yolk development being reabsorbed by the fish. This strategy can help a species shift energy from reproduction to growth or survival when conditions are not favorable. So now that I've shared a lot of information about trends and maturity, we should consider, does any of this really matter? Well, I would say, yes, it does matter. And in order to determine how this could impact spawning biomass estimates, we reran the 2015 model used in the Aurora Rockfish Stock Assessment and incorporated new estimates that, that counted for the spatial dynamics we reported. And we utilized the new model that captured rates of skip spawning. I would note that Aurora Rockfish estimates were not as largely different from previous estimates um, for the species I shared earlier. We have found that rates, the new rates did change spawning biomass estimates. With estimates in the northern region that incorporated rates of skip spawning, producing the largest differences from the 2015 base model. So that's shown here in orange. These were the estimates for the northern region um, that incorporated rates of skip spawning. The base model more closely aligned with estimates from the southern region. So the base model is actually in blue and it's and you can barely tell because it's following this red line almost perfectly. And the red line were the estimates um, from our new study for the southern region that incorporated rates of skip spawning. But there is a higher density of fishing and a larger abundance of the fish population actually occurs in the northern region. So while Aurora is not currently a species of concern, you could imagine how overfishing could occur if your spawning biomass estimates are matching up with a portion of the population that does not experience as much fishing pressure. 
So incorporating spatial relationships into management models is important. And not just size or estimates of size at maturity, but also important to consider rates of skip spawning. So now let's summarize some of the trends we've observed to see if we can identify potential drivers. So in sable fish, we found that length at maturity was similar along the entire coast, but age at maturity increased as you went down the coast. We also know that this is a well-mixed single stock. So potential drivers for change could be related to the environmental change between biogeographic regions. In ling cod, we saw something different. We saw a decrease in length and age at maturity as you progressed down the coast. We know that there is stock structure in north and south of Point Reyes. And so our differences observed in maturity didn't line up with the, the genetic stock clusters. So we could say that potential drivers are also related to the environmental changes between um, biogeographic regions, specifically north and south of Point Conception seem to produce the most extreme results. In Pacific Hake, we also found a decrease in size, age, and rates of skip spawning. We are currently investigating stock structure. So potential drivers are, we need to, to identify what stock structure is in Pacific Hake, but for now we can say that there was extreme differences north and south of Point Conception, California. In Aurora rockfish, we also found a decrease in length at maturity and rate of skip spawning as you progressed on the coast. We have not investigated stock structure in this species, so that is something that we should look at before we make too many assumptions. However, we did find that differences correlated north and south of Cape Mendocino, California, and we need to look at point conception as well. In Dover Sol, we found the opposite trend with length and age at maturity increasing as you progress down the coast. We have not identified stock structure in this species, but we are currently investigating this. So at the moment, we could say that we are investigating stock structure to see how this plays a role in Dover Sol, but we did find a latitudinal trend in reproductive um, patterns. Trends are not the same between species. In some cases, length at maturity stays the same and A50 varies. In others, length and, a and age at maturity and skip spawning vary, but the directional change is different among species. Because of this lack of consistency in the directional change, other drivers may also be influencing this variation. This could look like um, difference in reproduction type, meaning batch spawner versus live bearer, um, their migration pattern, if they're highly migratory or not migratory, if they're fast growing, slow growing, things of that nature. So there's a lot of other things to consider. So our analysis provided updated information for stock assessments. And what does this look like? Well, here's just a few species where we've updated information and in stock assessments. In Canary, we found that our coastwide estimates were about six centimeters larger than the previously reported um, studies. In Linka, we found that our estimates were much smaller than the previously reported studies. And if you remember in the 2021 stock assessment, they actually utilized um, estimates for our northern and southern management boundary, but the most extreme differences were actually north and south of Point Conception. So the, our estimates were even smaller in, our, in the southern region south of Point Conception. In Sablefish, our estimates were similar to previous studies, which is actually pretty cool. But I would mention that we found very dramatic differences in age and maturity as you progress down the coast. In Dover Sol, our estimates were similar to ones reported in 1952, which again, I think is really interesting that they could rem remain similar. However, we did find quite a bit of spatial differences in Dover Sol, something that hadn't been reported before and something that's gonna be really important for managers to understand more about. So what I hope you take away from this presentation is that latitudinal variability in maturity and rates of skip spawning is commonly observed in West Coast groundfish. And it's important to capture and quantify this in fisheries management models. However, the direction of change in maturity is variable, as you saw in some of the species we discussed. We found that size and age at maturity decreased per hake as you go down the coast. But in Dover Sol, we found the opposite trend with size and age and maturity increasing as you go down the coast. 
It is difficult to pinpoint the drivers of this variability and multiple factors may be playing a role. However, we did find a strong relationship with changes in maturity between important biogeographic regions wherein oceanographic conditions vary. So far, genetic differences we have observed have not strongly correlated with change in reproductive behaviors. But it is important to not discount genetic differences to this variability, and this should be thoroughly studied before from a species when you identify variability. We have also found temporal changes in maturity between years and in rates of skip spawning. This is very difficult to estimate as it requires a lot of sampling and can't be done for every species. So the Northwest Fisheries Science Center's Reproductive Biology Program is filling a critical gap in West Coast fisheries management. Prior to the implementation of this program, a lot of assessments had to rely on outdated localized studies that can lead to inaccurate estimates of spawning biomass, which can lead to overfishing or not reaching MSY. Understanding spatial temporal trends is really important for informing spatially structured assessments. As well as capturing rates of skip spawning in models can increase our accuracy. And with that, I have a lot of people to think, because as I mentioned before, none of this would be possible without the hard work of a lot of individuals involved in this. So I'd like to thank the entire West Coast Brownfish Bottom Trawl Survey, the crews of our chartered survey vessels, the At Sea Hake Observer Team, the Fisheries Acoustics and Engineering Team, the Hook and Line Survey of Southern California Bite, Amy Keller, my supervisor, for being very supportive. Um, I want to thank the FRAM Assessment Team. We have a wonderful relationship together. Um, they're very passionate and supportive of this work, and that makes me passionate about it. I want to thank our partners at Oregon and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, for all their valuable samples and input in this process. And lastly, I should thank the NOAA Marvels Working Group, the Maturity Assessment Reproductive Viability Life History Strategy Working Group, um, with a special thanks to Suzanne McDermott and Stan Ignatich for the Alaska Center for their expertise and trainings they have provided. And with that, any questions or thoughts, I'd be happy um, to comment. Well, thank you, Melissa. That was a great presentation. Um, you've really done a lot in the last 10 years. My goodness. Um, is there anyone who wanted to un unmute themselves and ask a question? Let's see, I think we have. We do have one question in the chat, which I can read first from Tom Lohr. Has anyone looked at latitudinal trends in exploitation for these species? Age or length specific trends in mortality can alter these curves, in particular by pruning mature individuals off the top while leaving higher proportions of immature individuals in the samples. Thus, realized maturity ratios can vary while individual maturation scales remain more stable. Well, that was a lot, but yes, I would say that's a really good point. Um, and something that does need to be looked at as we continue to identify latitudinal trends. I'm sure there has been some sort of analyses as to how exploitation rates vary along the coast, but we have not directly looked at how that um, could correlate with maturity patterns. So that's a really good thought. Wait for, oh, let's see. Rich McBride, would you like to unmute your, your microphone and ask a question? Yes, hi. And, and hi, Melissa. Great talk. I really enjoyed that. Thanks, um, I Yeah, I remember uh, hearing a little bit about the senescence of, uh, I think it was your silver hake out there, your Pacific hake. And um, it sounds like that's still, you're, you're still, it seems like a relatively rare example I'm wondering if you could comment, is that really unique to that species so far? Because senescence in, in, in fishes seems like just a, a rare, elusive thing that you, you, you found that in that one species. And, and, and does it really affect the, the model, the estimate of um, maturity? You, you have that spline method. Does it really bend the curve down in addition to uh, ordinary estimates of skip spawning? Yes, thank you, Rich. Um, 
I have not observed senescence in any other species that we have studied. I, I do think the fact that we have heavily sampled from Pacific Cake allowed us to collect a few individuals who were at the very extreme end of their life expectancy. So the ones that we did observe, I think were like 14 and 15, which is kind of almost outside of their life expectancy. Um, and so no, because for one, we have sampled so heavily from them, having a few fish and senescence isn't really driving the curve down. Um, but it, it's also really, we don't encounter those really old fish very often. So it would be interesting if in a perfect world, if I could just select, if I could just sample every, you know, 14, 15 year old hake and see what they look like, but it's so rare to encounter them. Um, I think like that was the majority of your question, but yes, it's, we haven't observed it in any other species and you're right. It's just a very rare thing to see. And I wonder if we were able to sample all these species as heavily as we've sampled Hake, if we would observe it or not. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll keep looking out here on the East coast too. All right. Cool. Thanks Rich. Good to hear from you. Another question in the chat from uh, Andrew Edwards for Hake. Is it practical to look at this every year? 2014 turned out to be such a big recruitment event, the largest since 2010, and such information would be useful um, in each assessment year. Yeah, it would be. Um, we have been sampling them every year. Um, I think the last two years we didn't because we have just sampled them so much and we really needed to shift focus on some other species. So we're taking a short break on them because um, we got a decade of, of data on them, but I, in an ideal world, they are assessed every year. We would be able to go out there in the field, collect samples, and have analysis done in time for the assessment. But that's just not how it usually ends up working out. Uh, for one, the assessments in January, and and then histological analysis is going to be done usually probably in the springtime from the previous year. Um, but that being said, if we did collect a decade of data on them, um, we might be able to identify how this looks under different oceanographic regimes. And that will inform us how we want to continue to proceed sampling from them in the future. So if we start to see some sort of trends related to the em environmental conditions, then that might tell us um, to be sampling from them every year and then be able to make some predictions. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks for a great question. Great, thanks. Next in the chat is a question from Kevin McNeil. For the moderate decreasing trends in maturity for lingcod, a potential indicator of senescence in that species. Um, I have not observed that, so I can't say that for sure. I, I would say that we need to continue um, researching that species to understand more about those trends. I did mention earlier um, that the southern population was a bit more of a concern um, due to abundance levels, and they were a little bit slower to recover when they were once overfished. And so part of me wonders after someone's comment about exploitation rates, if the decreasing sizes and age at maturity we observed um, in the southern population could be related to that the impact of um, them being fished heavily and recovering slowly. But again, I've consistently identified that things south of Point Conception are different than along the rest of the coast. Uh, oceanographic conditions are very different in that region. So it probably would be hard to pinpoint what is the exact driver. Um, but we know that the warmer waters down there definitely impact how the species respond uh, reproductively. Did that answer your question? Thanks. And then uh, a chat from Ian Stewart. He says, incredible work over the last 10 years, given the important spatial and temporal variability in maturity, 
Is the current sampling and histological analysis program sufficient to monitor these trends for the full suite of West Coast species? <laughs> Thank you, Ian, for that prompt. Um, Ian's one of our stock assessment scientists who's always been really supportive of this work. So thank you, Ian. I would say no, it's not enough. We need to be doing fecundity analysis. Um, I am essentially the only person that's doing this work right now in the FRAM division, and it's impossible for me to kind of keep up with the, the, the stock assessment needs um, as well as expand the program into fecundity analysis. So we need to understand how fecundity changes along the entire coast as well, and that requires um, more people. How many species? Sorry, what was that? Can you remind us of how many species you're working on? I think you mentioned it in one of your slides. We've studied 44 groundfish species thus far. Um, essentially, we attempt to collect samples a couple of years before an assessment's going to be due. And so that's what we've been collecting on. Um, but that's been used in 28 stock assessments thus far. Some of these species, we don't get a lot of them. And so we've just been collecting on them over the last five or six years so that when they're ready for assessment, we have enough data to inform the assessment. And Laura has another uh, question. Uh, another quick comment, in addition to mor mortality, if fish migrate as they mature, the realized proportions may also change spatially. That's a good point as well, yep. So many things to consider. This is the problem with fisheries management is that <laughs> once you start thinking about it, it's always so hard to determine what's the cause of what you're seeing because there's so many factors that go into these processes. I don't think I had heard about skip spawning until maybe five or 10 years ago. It's amazing to see it's being incorporated into all these stock assessments. I wondered for fish, um, I haven't done the histology on this, um, but I was wondering for a, a fish to be considered a skip spawner, does it mean that it has a reduced spawning capacity or is it just shut down 100%? Um, that's a good point. And that can vary sometimes in the literature. Um, for what we do, we generally consider if at least 25% of the mature oocytes are in an atritic state, so they're being uh, broken down and reabsorbed by the fish, then you would classify that as a skip spawner. Usually what that means is that they're going to continue to degrade and um, reabsorb those. But I do think in some of these fish, you might just see a reduction in the overall output. So, especially in the batch spawners where they can actually just abort a whole batch and then produce another batch later down. So they, they're just cycling through really fast. Um, in the rockfish, that looks a little different though, because they are live bearers. There's a lot more energy going into producing live young. It's a longer process. So often when they start to break down um, I, I think that it's generally going to be more of like a full um, skip spawning event and produce a, a lot less. So it is a good point. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a total failure to spawn. It is actually can be a reduction in the spawning output. So is there anyone else who wants to unmute and ask a question directly to Melissa? Hi, Melissa, it's Sabrina. Hey, uh, great work, great talk. Um, and thank you for just like a wonderful overview of your program and all the work that you've done with histology. I think you've got a number of histology slides. Um, that's like a pretty that you've read. It's pretty incredible. Um, it's really incredible. And I want to just ask a question with your samples. Are you also keeping preserved egg samples? Your fecundity analyses. I know that's like so outside your realm, but um, with the fecundity we, work we've done with the rockfishes, we do see what you say um, differences in 
you know, the size of the batches by year and also by female size and um, being able to put that all together would be really cool. I'm just curious if you do save save egg samples or if that's just like beyond the realm of possibilities. <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. And I wish I could say yes, that we have been, but we have not been. And part of it is this really unfortunate factor that we have this tiny, tiny lab for the whole Fram division, because um, the Fram division really expanded over time. It's a more recent division in our center and just haven't had the capability to store a lot. Um, I do have like some whole ovary samples that I've been storing like for Calcot and Yellow Eye. You know a little bit about that, Serena. Um, but maybe we should talk again someday in the future to figure out if there is a way that we could be doing that. Uh, I would really like to do that because that's where this program needs to go. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Chantel. <laughs> Is there anybody else? Well, you've answered well over 10 minutes of questions. That seems like a good um, stopping point. Um, why don't we let most people go, we'll kind of end things here. And if um, you're willing to hang out for a little bit more, Melissa, and see if um, there's just a few folks who want to uh, hang out and chat for a bit. Sounds great. And I put my contact info up here. If you have any questions, thoughts, or ideas, I always love to collaborate. So. This was a very popular topic. You had over a hundred attendees. And wow. I, think, I didn't know that. Yeah. So your work is, you know, it's really translating to different geographic areas where the species change, but the problem is the same. I'm glad I didn't know there was a hundred people here. There was, I just saw you Mark most of the time and that made me feel calm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should have interrupted you when we hit the hundred mark. So that... <laughs> yeah, just so you know, there's a lot of pressure, Melissa. You need to perform well. There's a hundred people here. Thanks for everybody that came out today. Um, anybody that's still on here, I know a lot of you I've worked with and I've learned a lot from. So I'm really grateful for all of that. The remaining folks want to unmute and talk to Melissa. Hey, uh, Melissa, it's your office mate here hey, well, from the from the before times. I'm I'm thinking about Dover Soul, and uh, and it would be really interesting to. I'm trying to think of another like flatfish that's subject to so much trawling pressure in the north, that's basically unfished in the south, and it'd be really interesting to see if you see the same kind of you know, higher A50, L50 in the south, just because, you know, there's no, our survey is the only ones who ever trawl down there versus, you know, a whole fleet of fishing activity, maybe, um, you know, lowering the age and size of maturity uh, up north. Like, I don't know, I'm thinking sand dab, something like that. Uh, something that eventually someone might care about for an assessment, but it'd be really interesting to see if, you know that might that might be an indication that uh, that that difference in trends is related to fishing pressure. Um, I have no idea. It's just just spitballing, but uh, that'd be an no. interesting thing to look at on top of everything else you're doing. <laughs> well, Peter, maybe you can help with that if you're interested. But this is Peter right here. In case anybody's still on here, wants to know who was talking. Um, Peter, that is a really great point. And this is why it's so good to give these talks and hear what people think. Because now I really want to look at exploitation rate um, between these regions to see if that's one of the influences um, when I'm not seeing the same directional change, you know, where it's not just they're all decreasing as you go down the coast. And I'm wondering, I know there's been work done on Petrali, but I can't remember if there was a lot of latitudinal analysis. And Lindsay Lefebvre did that work. I don't know if she's on here, but 
Um, and that might be a species to think about, but I like your thoughts and maybe we can talk some more about um, another species that we can look to see that might be similar. Oh, wait, Jason Cope just said something, which is always of value to you. Jason, can you unmute? I didn't see your comment. It went away. If you're yeah, No, I was just going to, well, it's a great talk, obviously. Um, I was just thinking about the exploitation rate and stuff and things that you're showing. Obviously, there's some life history variation in there as well as the potential that the current depletion. So, the current stock status may also be a factor. Relating to some of these changes that we see, so it's kind of all in the same ballpark of exploitation history current depletion being. Uh, achieved by that exploitation history, etc. So, lots of fun stuff to look at. Okay, thank you, Jason. I'm going to write both those things down to look at in the future. Thank you. Good to hear your voice. Thanks for all the great comments. This is really good for me to consider moving forward to. Well, we're getting close to the top of the hour. I'm sure everyone has other meetings to go to. Um, Perhaps we should end things there. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Great presentation, Melissa. It was great to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mark. Great.